adjustments and we're good. Awesome. Sweet. All right, guys, so what we're going to do here, this is a live podcast. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, this is the first time I've ever done this. I've done the podcast a few times. These guys are podcast pros. Um, but a live audience uh, with a speaker. I don't know. We're going to see what happens. So what we're going to try to do, we're going to talk a little bit, um, just um, get to know these guys, and then you guys are going to have the opportunity to come and sit here. We're going to kick Cooper off, and then you guys are going to have the opportunity to come on for a little bit of time, ask them some questions. So think of some questions you have regarding just business, entrepreneurship, whatever you might have. I think that's about it. I think with the introduction, is that staying by your face, or is it kind of... I haven't tried it yet. I think See so. if it works, so... Yeah. Maybe. Close enough. We'll see what happens. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do an introduction, and then we're going to get rolling. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the Dot Was Two podcast. It's hosted by Q. Thank you very much to Q for hosting this. Yeah, good stuff. Um, it's an exciting opportunity. We have Cooper here to my left. Um, he's been on a couple of times, although you haven't seen the other episode yet. Um, this is going to be a great episode. I can't wait. I'm going to introduce our guest here. We have Joe Abraham and we have Scott Moffitt. Guys, give him a hand. Come on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. I met you guys at the pitch. Um, you guys were judges. Um, we did the uh, peace counseling. Um, shout out my team. And you gave us some insight. We were able to just chat afterwards. Um, Cooper, you want to ask, uh, since you know these guys doing the Kingdom Commerce podcast, um, just have a little context question so we uh, can get to know them. Yeah, so I'll do a little bit of introduction. Uh, Scott Moffitt. Wait, who are you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cooper. Um, so <laughs> Scott Moffitt here, he's the uh, head of partnerships at his company, Ideal Strategic Partners, uh, down in Tampa, Florida. He works with uh, hundreds of entrepreneurs getting their uh, product to a launch stage, and he's been very successful in that field. And Joe Abraham, serial entrepreneur, uh, co-founder of Beyond Academics, and... Uh, does a lot with entrepreneurship as well, advises um, several entrepreneurs. And so these guys, these guys know what they're talking about. They're Christians. They have a heart for the Lord. And uh, we're just going to get to know them a little bit tonight. And um, first off, Scott, I just want to say thanks again for being here. My and um, if you could add just a little bit of context to kind of your journey, maybe talk about the Christian aspect of, of being an entrepreneur. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I'll address the first first part first. So just kind of the journey, and it's been a winding road. Um, entrepreneurship isn't linear. Uh, it never started with me thinking I was going to own a business or run a business. Um, God took me down that path, and uh, there was a lot of lessons that I've learned, and uh, in that process, uh, a lot led me to humility. So working for someone else and um, knowing that there's a better way but knowing that it's not your position to enforce that, but to recommend it. And then ultimately, when, when God opened that door and said, you know, that there was a calling in the appointing, um, and then the appointing happened, and I stepped into that, and it's been, it's been an amazing experience. So um, my background, Ideal Strategic Partners, were a little over a three-year-old company. Um, we, with Ideal Strategic Partners, we've, we have 39 portfolio companies. Um, the company I worked for previously, I was head of business development, we had over 300 portfolio companies, and I was I had a, my hand in a little over 100 of those. Um, but it's it's really just the multiplication effect for me. So it's it's taking people. There's a lot of great ideas out there, and people think that ideas are you know what make you successful. They're not. I've seen great ideas fall flat on their face, and I've seen average or what I believe to be subpar ideas tremendously successful because of the execution. So the goal is in the execution, and that's what our company does, is we, we execute on those ideas. So um, that's my background, and uh, Cedarville has a special place in my heart. It takes a lot to, uh, to come out to the cornfields, but I, I, love, I love being here at every you time I have that the opportunity. Again, it, takes a lot. <laughs> I, 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 it does. I, I, I love Cedarville. I love coming here. Um, the drive, I, I could do without, but I, I do love being here, and uh, the students, the faculty, everything that, that Q, I mean, Will, your podcast, I, I watch it, and what you've done in just a short period of time has been pretty impressive. So, mm. congratulations. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, Joe, could you give us a little more background about yourself and, and how you've seen yourself grow uh, with the Lord in your entrepreneurial journey? Awesome. And then also, I think we have uh, Aaron. Is that coffee for both of them <laughs> or for Scott? Aaron for offered Scott? me okay. coffee. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, yeah, he offered From his flight, so awesome. Go ahead. I'll never say no to coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so when Will said I'm a serial entrepreneur, that really just means you go from one thing, you build one company, then you start the next company, then you start the next company, like you just can't stop. It's like a drug. <laughs> and so that's me. The entrepreneurship bug bit me when I was in college. About your guys' age, I uh, started my first business with my college roommate and really haven't looked back since. And so I've had the opportunity to build little businesses in distribution, um, technology, motorsports, consulting. Like it's just been all over the place, but it's just been finding the next problem and trying to find a solution for it. That's really what entrepreneurship is. Awesome. What inspired you to start a business while at college? And so like in college, obviously academics, um, you, did you major in business? Of what I, no, I was a bio major. Bio no. major. I, just, I was just broke. I needed to make money. And like I, <laughs> I realized that, you know, okay, I'm going to get go my undergrad and then there's probably grad after that mm -hmm. maybe. Like I was so far away from real income mm -hmm. that a friend said, like, I've got this business opportunity. We can just sell stuff and make money on the side. And that's all I needed to hear initially, right? I was just wanted to generate income. Okay. Then, of course, over time, the Lord kind of cleans that out of your system. But that's yep. where it all started was, hey, side hustle, make money. Wow. That's awesome. And one thing I really am passionate about is productivity. I think there's a lot of statistics out there of the amount of time wasted in a day, let alone like a year. Um, some people say um, in certain areas it's up to two hours a day is wasted just from not being efficient and productive in what you're doing. Um, in your time of being entrepreneurs, business owners, what has kept you productive consistently for long periods of time? So there's, you can have these moments where you're in what's called the flow state where you're really attacking it and you're doing great. But how are you able to maintain that for a long period of time? And Scott, uh, we talked about a little bit before this, so I'll let you go first and yeah, Jump I mean, it, it, once you have the answer, I'd love to hear it. Um, and for me, it's it's productivity is kind of like two analogies that I think are the most pertinent, at least in my mind, they are kind of our walk with Christ, right? You never attain, you know, the, the a Christ-like, you know, you can be more Christ-like, but you, you're never going to attain living the life of Christ, right? We're not, we're all imperfect in that way. And so I think there's always areas for, or opportunities for improvement. Um, Golf is another great example, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you, you're you never, I mean, even the best pros in the world, they strive to be, continue to get better. It's not a destination, it's a journey. And um, I've got a long way to go on my journey. Um, it, there's so much that plays into that. I mean, some of the factors, and I'd love to hear Joe talk about this too, is, is um, delegation. You know, the right time to delegate, the wrong time to delegate, you know, that's a huge decision because that's what opens up for more time, more bandwidth, and, and the ability to be more productive and work on the business rather than in the business. But there's a right time for it and there's a wrong time for it. If you delegate too early um, and you offboard that too early, um, you're, you know, you have the, your vision could get lost in the shuffle. Whereas if you hold on to it too long and you try to kind of be a control freak and manage, you know, over, um, micromanage and, and have your hand on everything. One of the things that's really stuck with me and, and it's been in my prayer life and, and I've talked to my team about this a lot lately is when I hire people, I had a new hire on Monday, and when I hire people, I don't hire people to tell them what to do. I hire people for them to tell me what to do, right? So I want to hire people that, that I trust their ability. If I have a problem, I can task them to find a solution. They'll find a solution. I'm not going to second guess it. They'll give me their reasoning. They'll give me, they'll, they'll validate it in their mind. Um, those are the type of people that I want to hire. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I love the topic of productivity. You'll never run out of of material to discuss on it um, because in my opinion I don't think you can ever be fully productive I think there's always another tier mm -hmm. that's my thought I'd love to hear your take on it Joe um, I, I think productivity is like it's not one size fits all you're all fearfully and wonderfully made and like you're all different and I'm different so for for you will like productivity is a passion mm -hmm. so you may look at your day and go oh my gosh if I just wasted 15 minutes on this I just what a terrible day. Mm -hmm. And someone else would be like, man, I could sit around for two hours and just stare at the moon and be okay with it, right? So with yeah. that in mind, I think it's my encouragement to everyone when it comes to productivity, because even in our company, some people are like, productivity, productivity, and others are like, I don't give a rip. So like, it's how do you find your thing? Mm -hmm. And um, Cooper's heard me talk about this a lot. It's do you know your spiritual gifting? Because people, I find people who, are, who have spiritual gifting in administration find productivity very exciting. 
yeah. right? But people who, who have, let's say, a spiritual gifting in mercy or something else um, could care less. So it's with your spiritual gifts, are you being the most productive you can be as you discern that with God? Mm -hmm. You know, like you can be super productive as a student um, studying one way, another student does it a different way. So yeah, with that said, um, I find, I'm going to borrow a little bit of what he said, for me, I'm the most productive when I'm in my sweet spot. Yeah. The things I'm really good at, when I'm doing those things, they don't feel like work. So I can do those for hours and hours and hours. But then when someone says, go balance the checkbook, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is like short nails on a chalkboard. Yeah. And so who can I give that to, yeah. right? In my case, like my wife's going to do that because she's better at it than me. Um, in some of your cases, maybe a teammate in a working group. It may be, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend. Just de delegate to whoever you can the things that you're terrible at. Yeah. And then you end up being much more productive. And then measurability, right? So productivity, how do you measure productivity, right? It's based on, on what? On the metrics. So planning. So when I go in every day, I make a list of 10 things that I want to accomplish that day. I know good and well I'm not going to accomplish all 10 of them. My, my metric is if I can get three of those tasks done, um, then I, I feel like, and this is, it's different for everyone, and depending on season, sometimes it might be five tasks, sometimes it's seven, but in the season I'm in right now, if I get three of those tasks done, it's been a productive day in my mind, because a lot of, a lot of what I do in, in this season is reactive, and, and it's challenging because it's, it needs to be reactive, but when you have prepared, you know, we've all heard, prepare, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. If, if we don't, if, if you don't prepare, how do you measure? Like, what's a litmus test? Am I being productive? Am I being productive enough? I walk, I drive home every day, and I, in my mind, was it a productive day? And that's my metric. That's how I kind of self-assess. Okay. It seems like the why is connected to productivity, right? Because when you have a business that you're starting, you really have to be really intense, and you kind of it becomes your baby in a way. What would you say your why is? <coughs> As an entrepreneur, because entrepreneurship is hard, it's it's almost unnatural the the amount of effort and focus and, uh, and intense intense work that goes into it. So what's what's behind it all? Well, but so is being a cross country runner. So is being a student at you know Cedarville. Like it's hard. But to your point, what's your why for doing it? Right. Mm -hmm. If you've got a goal, if you've got a vision, then suddenly what seems hard to other people isn't that hard for you. Now in entrepreneurship. Specifically, yeah, you have to have a really big why. A lot of you will have some great ideas while you're students, and they may be the greatest, or your, your big idea may not come to your 25 or 30 years old, right? Um, but you'll know it because the why, your desire to make that idea real, will overwhelm you. It'll be all you can think about. It'll just drive you to do crazy things that you never would have done before. And so the why comes when, with the idea, mm -hmm. with the solution. Um, and then when it's there, it's almost like this automatic juice. You're not tired. You suddenly are super productive because you're working more hours because it's, it's just in you. More. It's just a passion. It's yeah. just, you know, it just kicks in. But until the why shows up or until the idea shows up, it's, it's, everything feels harder. But honestly, if you ask most entrepreneurs, they love what they do because hopefully they have a good why driving them. And the entrepreneurs who don't like what they do, they just pick the wrong business and they're just kind of dragging it along. Yeah. But they really shouldn't be running that business. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, obviously working with my team, preparing for the pitch. That was something that we were passionate about. The idea kind of came from uh, Stand for Life or Pro Life Day here at Cedarville. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the amount of hours we put in to go over it beforehand was kind of insane considering like we have a nurse major on our crew, um, business major, whatever, right now as a freshman. But it was interesting how I could just turn it on. It's like, I'm passionate about this idea. Mm -hmm. It wasn't work anymore. And it wasn't work anymore. Yeah. It was like, we had a great time together. Um, we were on stage in the uh, the recital hall, which is right beside the pitch. Um, that was actually the night I met you for the first time. And we, we weren't very productive then, to be honest. We were just <laughs> messing around. We were having a blast, but we were like trying to figure it out, getting ready for the, the pitch. And um, that was an amazing experience. So I th it's an interesting idea how a passion and work just becomes fun. The, the why has to go beyond the product, though. It, it just has to. Because even though the initial incite excitement, it's almost like, you know, when you 
first start dating someone, it's like you're, you're even like the first year or two of marriage. Like it, it's the honeymoon phase. It's like everything is enjoyable, but just like anything that's worthwhile in life, it takes work. It takes it takes intentionality. It takes commitment. And um, what's going to get you through those valleys? You know, it, it's a peak. You're almost on this like you know, dopamine adrenaline high when you start because you love what you're doing. You see the vision. You know, you, you know that you can impact lives, not just yours, obviously, but others in a positive way. So there's there's this excitement. But, I mean, I've never met an entrepreneur that didn't hit a wall that they didn't think they were going to be able yeah. to overcome. Um, and at that point, it's easy to just kind of, you know, put your tail between your legs, turn around and, and pack up your, your, your bat and ball and go home, right? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's the why needs to be separate. I mean, yes... And this is something actually I've been wrestling a little bit lately with and I'm very grateful that it doesn't apply to my business. But do you really have to love what you're doing or is there stepping stones to getting to what your purpose is in life, right? Yeah. Like, so, you know, sometimes those stepping stones, they're not made of gold. You know, they're not gold plated and you don't see them clearly, right? Um, and they're not comfortable to step on, you know, but... If there, if you have that why and that intentionality of, of why you're doing what you're doing, and you, you believe in what you're doing, you don't. I don't. I don't believe you have to love what you're doing. Mm. I just believe that you have to know that it's you're having a positive impact on the lives of others, mm. and it's going to ultimately help you to accomplish your why as an individual. We all have our own whys, our own desires yeah. that God's placed in our heart, and that's that's what keeps you going through the tough times. Because the tough times, yeah. it's not if, it's when. Yeah. Yeah. Cooper, I'll let you ask a question. I'm going to go fix his mic for a sec. So, okay. Oh, my mic? So, you guys, you're all the way out here in the cornfields, right? Scott, you've been to three pitch competition. Yeah. This is your fourth time here, maybe. Mm -hmm. Joe, this is your second time. Second time here. You've mm -hmm. been to one pitch second, competition. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're both Christian entrepreneurs. You're here with at a pretty small university, medium sized university. What is, what is the motivation behind what you're doing as Christian entrepreneurs? Um, tell, maybe you tell us a little bit about how, how your faith and entrepreneurship um, have gone together, how, um, how you seek to glorify God in, in your ventures. Just a little bit of background on that and, and, and just the reason for pouring into us young entrepreneurs. Yeah, I, I wish I saw it as pouring into you guys. This is selfishly like a high for me. Because um, being able to, like, when I hear the pitches and yeah. all the pitches I heard, like, they're inspiring. They're, they, they fire the entrepreneur in me up mm -hmm. because I'm like, my gosh, these are really cool ideas. And, and these people are excited about it. And, like, it's, it's one entrepreneur feeds off another entrepreneur, which is why it's so important that you guys are part of this group. Because you may not have your idea yet, but somebody else's idea fires you up and, it, you know, or you kind of feed off of each other. So for me... Being around um, the next generation of entrepreneurs excites me because it kind of says, man, there's, there's better days ahead, you know, compared to even some of the bonehead ideas we've come up with. Um, so that's one part of it. But then, purely from a faith perspective, um, I, do, I do feel like, and every Christian entrepreneur at some point feels like, okay, so you've done some things, you made a couple dollars, now what? What are you going to do with it? Like, you've learned a couple things, you've stubbed your toe, um, You've got a couple ideas on things, like what are you going to do with it? And um, I'm going to give an account for that, just like you guys are going to give an account for everything you do. So I'm going to give an account for all the knowledge I gained, what few money dollars I got to make. So I want to be able to give a good account, right? So coming to the cornfields is kind of like God knows that I could have been home watching TV or I could have been relaxing, but hopefully this is part of the well done, good and faithful servant part, you know, you get to hear. You never know, but like, yeah, so it's, okay, God, put more stuff in my way. I'll go do it. Just tell me where to go. It's part of it as well. Yeah. No, that was, I mean, I don't, ditto, but I, I'll, I'll add a little bit to it. And, and that is, um, so I, and I don't even know, Cooper, if you know this. I didn't graduate high school. So um, about two weeks before my senior year, um, I, uh, two weeks before graduation, um, I you know, this was almost 20 years ago now, there was something that happened with another student and I didn't end up graduating. So I got my GED, never went to college. Um, and now 
God has blessed me with a, uh, an, uh, an eight-figure business that I'm able to steward, and um, I'm very grateful for it. And to me, education was always um, higher education, education in general. I, I, I don't like the structure of our education system in America. I, you know, I, I've done a lot of research and studying about the Rockefellers and when education was started and the reasoning behind it and creating followers, not leaders. And everything that I've experienced with Cedarville has been completely the opposite of what I viewed education to be. So it's been such a breath of fresh air to come here. I, I've, I've told you, Cooper, <coughs> since I started coming, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, that it's like a small piece of heaven. You know, you have, you know, the young young adults that are just, you know, bucking the trend of what you see in culture, on social media, and you see, you know, people that are on fire for Christ, and, and you see a program that's supporting entrepreneurship. Like, you have to understand, and 10 years ago, 15 years ago, entrepreneurship and college, they were like adversaries. Like it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a synergistic conversation. There was, it was, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur and I'm, you know, I don't need school, I'm just gonna start a business and do this. Um, or I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna get a job, I'm gonna work for someone else and I'm gonna, you know, get a retirement and, you know, walk the safe line in life. And, and now to see a program like this of Christ followers, of people that are, are utilizing their spiritual gifts, you have Dr. Heyman, the dean of the School of Business, you have KO that's, that's um, overseeing the entrepreneurial school, you have, you know, Annie who's doing a great job with Q and, and this whole organization and what you guys have done with the pitch events. I mean, the first pitch event that I went to compared to the last one, I mean, they just keep getting better. So yes, I will be here in October and that will be my fourth pitch event and I'm super excited about it. Joe's committed to, I don't know if you remember, but I'm going to remind them. So, um, but it's, I mean, just to see higher education and a Christ, you know, a Christ following institution supporting entrepreneurship, fostering entrepreneurship, having organizations like Q, um, for me not to be a part of it, to not be a vessel, like you said, like, yeah, I made a few bucks and, and I've learned lessons. Some were enjoyable lessons to learn and some were absolutely not enjoyable lessons to learn, but lessons nonetheless. And if I can pass on, if, if, if people walk away from a conversation with me or hearing me speak, um, it, it's not, you know, I'm not here to pontificate. If, if, if there's 1% of my mistakes uh, that someone can learn from and not make that same mistake, then it's a win, in my opinion. And so being able to take what I've learned and, and pour that into Christ followers who are pursuing entrepreneurship, I mean, like Joe said, it's selfishly, it's, I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. it's awesome. so before we kind of get into the one last topic I want to talk about, who here so far has questions? I'd love to give you guys the opportunity to come on, even just to come on, chat for a bit. We need a few of you at least. You can sit up here in front of the camera. Annie, if you don't have a question, we're going to have something to talk about. We're going to, yeah, so. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Awesome. So um, we'll get into the last discussion. And if you're ready for a question, if you just want to come up by Annie probably, um, just get ready there. Um, but the last thing right now I want to talk about is the importance of Christians in business, specifically when it comes to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Joel Wayne, he was a guy that came to Cedarville. He was... Uh, he spoke at two chapels, I think. Um, mm. He's from Michigan. And so he owns a business. His wife owns a business, but they also facilitate a church. So he preaches wow. um, while owning a business. What do you think the role of Christian entrepreneurs have within the church and helping the church? Yeah, so a very good friend of mine, um, Earl Seals, who I think is a donor here. I believe he is. His, His kids, kids went here. Yeah, they, yeah. So, still does, oh, okay. So I'm one of the biggest Earl Seals fans there is. And one of the things, he formed an organization a while ago called Christian Business Fellowship. And he was the, I was the first guy he tapped on the shoulder to help him get it off the ground. And he said, Joe, the reason we're setting this thing up is because I've been led by God to get entrepreneurs together, gather them up, help them out as much as I can. But really, I need them to build the church. Mm -hmm. Right? So his vision, which was very clear from God and was very well supported and all that, kind of marries what you're saying and supports what you're saying, which is a, the, being a Christian entrepreneur is great. You can have all kinds of impact. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. But really, the question is, with what you end up generating in resources and wealth and talent, how can that be used to build the church? 
In some cases, it's just at a very practical level at your local church. Hey, they need to build a new building. They need a new you know, play yard for the kids, and you may have the resources to fund that. And in some cases, it's, hey, the pastor, you know, the, the youth pastor needs to move and can't afford to pay for their moving truck, right? It's little simple practical things that only an entrepreneur can solve in many cases. And in some cases, it's the big stuff, right? You guys look at your Bible app. If those of you that use the Bible app, it was, it, that whole thing started because a company, you know, funded an entrepreneurial idea that now millions and millions of people are blessed by. So yeah. that's all entrepreneurs. Was that Gateway Church? That, that started, yeah, but they needed people they like this to step up and write big checks, yeah. you know, to make that possible. Just like the Hobby Lobby family and that's all, it. everything. All the, yeah, but unfortunately, and we said this on our podcast earlier today, there simply aren't enough Christian billionaires. There, like, some of you think about funding your startup someday, right? You may, have, you may need to go get funding, and one of the big questions will be, do I just go to any VC or funding source, or should I go to a Christian uh, investor, right? Well, I was saying to the guys, if you say you want a Christian investor, your market just shrunk by like 98% yeah. because there's just only so many of them. So the question is, how does your generation, how does even our generation expand that footprint so that when the next generation comes needing funding for great kingdom ideas, they aren't going to the other side, so to speak, and getting laughed at. Yeah. There's plenty of you guys and us who can write those checks and, and build that next generation. So that's, that's part of the Christian entrepreneur's calling, yeah. is how do you prepare for the next generations? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a great answer. I, the, I would add the, one of my pastors in my church, uh, I have a great relationship with <clears throat> Pastor Jesus. It's always funny when I call him on my phone, it says, calling Jesus. Mm, and so, that's great. <laughs> but um, Pastor Jesus, he, he's, he's, he's told me, and, and he kind of prophesied this on me, you know, I don't talk about what I do within my church very often. It's just not a topic of conversation and something that I, I discuss very often. But I, I told him, you know, some of the challenges that, that I was having in the business, and I wanted him to pray for me and intercede and, and come in the gap. And um, he came back and said, you know, you, you were meant to be a kingdom financer. And so the reason why I think that that Joe talks about, you know, you lose 98% of your market, I, I feel like there's this stigma that, um, you know, having wealth is a bad thing. Um, and it's not because when God does, and, and he can do anything with nothing, right? I mean, he's, look what he did to, to feed thousands with, you know. It, it, but yeah. the, the, the point is, is that when when he when Jesus comes back, right, and and there's going to be a purpose to be um, that that needs to be accomplished, it's going to require resources, right? And so having those resources and being able to carry out his purpose, um, you know, wealth is not a bad thing. In fact, we, we were made to be the head, not the tail. Like it's it'd be. A, a, having, you know, favor in our lives and over our ventures, it's about heart posture, you know, and, and that's one of the topics we talked about last season, which is, you know, is, is money evil or is it the love of money? If money becomes a false idol, then that's a problem. But when you talk about the church, that always um, automatically the, you know, the devil's advocate in my head just starts going, Are we, what is the church? The church is not the four walls. It's the, it's the people. It's the body of Christ, right? That's, that's what the church is to find the Bible. And so, being able to support and, and, and act like Christ and being able to give back and support, that's a gifting that we have, and we've been blessed with those resources. Nothing that we have is ours. We can't take any of it with us. So having wealth doesn't make me any better than, you know, a homeless person on the side of the street. It, it, all it does is allow me to do more and to be able to help more and support a more kingdom vision. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we'll get our first question and first audience guests on here. Awesome. Um, there we go. How are you guys feeling so far? Good. Live audience Great. broadcast. I see a couple, entre I see a couple entrepreneurs we'll in see. here myself. I, I see uh, Eve has her cookie company. Stop I followed and you. seen very Let's successful. John. John. How are you doing, John? Nice to meet you. <clears throat> What's up? Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Well done. I got a question for you guys. Mm. It's a good one, too, I hope. Cool. What was the process of you guys making your first 100000 That's the first question. Of gross, like, ever revenue or personal income? Because let's, let's I could start a business and generate hundred grand and make zero, right? Because yeah. everything went to product costs mm -hmm. or whatever. But, or, so you're thinking just hitting that first hundred k in company business? Net, or net. Net, okay. Yeah. All right. We got the question. Okay. Um, what was the process in it? Yeah, the process. Because I feel like a lot of times, like, people just 
have all these big ideas, but then they don't actually know how much work it takes just to reach that first hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So I feel like just knowing what what's the process. Obviously, th like there's a lot to it, but just getting some insight from you guys. Yeah. So talking. you know, there's all the obvious stuff, right? Like just hard work and grit and like, right? Yeah. You're gonna get the door slammed in your face a bunch of times before you get to 100k of net. Yeah. You're gonna have a lot of disappointment. You're gonna have people you hire who disappoint you. You're gonna have, you know product that was supposed to ship that ships late, all that's going to have to happen before you net 100K in whatever. But I think the main things to, to get to 100K of net is a really good business model. And what I mean by that is if it's a product, let's say it costs you eight bucks to make a product, and you may say, well, I'm going to sell it for 16, and I think that's still pretty good. It's going to take a lot longer to get to 100K net than if you take the eight and multiply it by five, mm -hmm. right? And build enough brand value to make that product worth 40, um, because then you have plenty of margin to pay employees, buy advertising, do all the stuff you want to do, and still have money left for net. So I think a key thing to keep in mind when it comes to profitability and net is your multiplier on cost. So if it's a product, you have to multiply it by at least, I would say, at least four or five. Um, in some cases, three is okay, but if it's a service business, you want to multiply by three. And so that's going to get you to your 100K a lot faster yeah. than most. And would you say, like, after reaching your first 100 grand, it becomes easier? I mean, always, I mean, there's a lot of work to it, but, like, do you feel like once you reach your first 100 grand, you have, like, the Some most things do get though. easier, right, Scott? Because you now have a few bucks in the account to pay for certain things that yeah. you were having to do yourself, right? You stop losing hair. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you stop. The, the, stre the, stress le the stressors become different. Yeah. The problems right. become, or the challenges become bigger. Yeah. But they're, they're, they become bigger in a sense that the decisions and the way that, that you handle them have a much larger impact on more people and more dollars. But... The challenges, generally speaking, aren't, um, am I going to make rent this month, right? Yeah, there's like, you know, there's like, little the money problems and big money problems, yeah. right? On your way to your first 100K, you have little money problems. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know how we'll pay for this website, or I don't have the 800 bucks to run the advertising this month, right? right. And those seem like big problems, but those are little money problems. Yeah. When you get to 100K of net, you don't care about the 800 bucks now because you can spend it easily. Mm -hmm. But now you have another set of problems because you've hired three people, yeah. and they're not working hard at their job and you got to fire them now, right? And that suddenly becomes a much bigger deal, letting someone go, because now you know they're not going to be able to make their rent and all that kind of stuff. So a different set of problems arise. Entrepreneurship is you're constantly solving problems. The, the problems just get different, and in some cases bigger, the more zeros you add. And I'm going to turn the question around. So you, do you feel that that first 100000 do you think that that would change things? And, and, and I'll answer your question. I'm, I fully intend to answer the question, but I'm, I'm asking just to understand where that question is coming from. Do you feel that things would get easier once you make your first 100,000 net? I don't think things will, will get easier because I think it just gets harder because you're trying to, if, I mean, if you're trying to make, let's say, a million, it gets harder. I mean, the more, I mean, the more you want to make, it just gets harder and harder. But I just feel like once you reach the $100,000 mark, I feel like, I feel like you have like both like the systems you're down, breathing room. like you're into yeah. it a bit, but then then you just then you start then you got to start using your money more wisely. Yeah. You also have credibility, right? A bank yeah. will be like excited to talk mm -hmm. to you guys, you know. Um, even, gosh, for me, like even my mom and dad, for my first ten years of entrepreneurship, they were like, "What do you do again? <laughs> like, shouldn't you also have a job at the same time? Like, shouldn't you go get an MBA? You know?" So like, but when my first successful business, they could validate it. They were like, "Oh." Oh, no. you know, you did what? You're and so you have off credibility, house, so there, there's a piece of that too, you know? Sure. So the, the reason that I asked you that question is that I feel like you, there needs to be a paradigm shift in your mind just from that question, because once you <coughs> can afford to pay yourself 100000 to me, what that means is that you validated your business, and at that point, you should be throwing gasoline on the fire or accelerant into the business, uh -huh. so it shouldn't even be liquidating. At the point that you're able, that you're able to pull 100000 out, you shouldn't. Um, because at that point, in my opinion, and, and again, everyone's situation is different, so I don't want to make a blink. Let me digress. Let me retract that blanket statement. Most cases, you shouldn't do that. And the reason you shouldn't do that is the, quick, the quickest way to 
to train wreck a business is to take cash out of it right out of the gate and not reinvest. Like our pro formas for our portfolio companies, and, and keep in mind our company, we start, people come to us with an idea on a napkin. Sometimes it hasn't even made it to a napkin. Um, and we bring them to market launch, commercialization to where the revenue scale the business. So if you don't start with the end in mind, like what is your vision? What is your purpose? And there's gonna be a lot of pivots. It's almost like if you go on a road trip, you know, you plug in your end destination and there's going to, if it's a cross country road trip, you will have detours. There's gonna be accidents, there's gonna be construction, but if you have the end destination plugged in, you know where you're going. So being able to know that there's, you know, leveling up and like, okay, I've accomplished $100,000 that I could pull out, but if I put it back into the business and I get, let's call it a 4X ROAS, return on ad spend for my uh, digital marketing, well, then you're going to get $4 for every dollar you spend. So it's, the question more so is, you know, should you take out the 100000 as soon as you're able to? And, and my answer to that would be no. It would be to scale the business. But, but in general, though, when you get your bit, every business is different and whether, you know, product service, but if you get your business to a revenue of around half a million a year to a million a year of top line gross revenue, you should be able to comfortably, as the owner, pull out 100 grand a oh, year yeah. after all the bills are paid, employees mm -hmm. are paid, blah, 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 blah. So if that's your, one of your income goals, personal income goals, then you need to set a target of a half a million to a million dollars of annual revenue. We, as a general statement, we, we recommend 10% of gross revenue. Yeah, there you go. 10% okay. or so, to his point, about a million, you'd be able to pull about 100,000. Awesome. Because you do have to live, you know, you have to live comfortably. You know, you'll, you'll want to start a family and get married and have kids. So it's not like you should, you know, live on ramen noodles for the rest of your life, even though you have a successful business. But yeah. it's just, you know, what the heart of the question was what I was trying to undercover was, is it wanting to put 100000 in your pocket, or when can I do this and be able to scale further? Right. Awesome. Well, thank you for the question. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks cool. for coming thanks, on. Sean. I think we're going to have Great Aaron question. on. Um, talk about another question. Aaron Perry. Yeah. Come on down. Aaron himself. You were, a, you were a judge for his uh, pitch idea. I was. Correct? I was. Nice. I was. Great to see you. Thank yeah. you for the coffee. <laughs> What's up, Aaron? Yeah. OK, so I got a question about brand. To mm. preface, I have my business, Ultra Light Running. It's an ultra marathon company. Um, and so that's something I'm struggling with is brand. I was listening to a podcast called Founders, and it was talking about um, the founder of Red Bull and how he pretty much created a cult-like following. Mm -hmm. He first started in Germany. They started doing black market trading for Red Bull to get it across Europe. Mm -hmm. And then once he launched in Europe, it exploded yep. and then brought it to the U.S. And so and you saw the same thing in Nike with Nike paying for the color Jordans for Michael. And so I'm, I'm curious about brand. How do you build a brand and how do you recommend kind of starting that process? Oh, that's one of my favorite topics. I love brand stuff. So I want to keep it super short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> well, I'll you know, like, I go on and on and on. Um, what you'll find about brands like Nike and Red Bull and many of the others that like, like an Apple, right? The founder infused an ethos into the brand of coolness. Yeah. Uh, and they infused core values into the brand. Like, you know, if you, if you watch the Nike movie Air, you know, the, the core values that sit in the back, you know, and then the movie was about the core values. Those are the things that are intrinsic to building a great brand, is infusing your, your ethos, your passion into it, and then finding a following of people who buy into it. Mm. So I think brand is just as much the logo, the icon, the product, as it is letting your audience know what you guys stand for, what you believe in, who you are, and those brands are not afraid to do it. Um, if you think of the early days of Apple, if you study the early days of Apple, they were like, we want to build cool stuff and we don't give a blank who likes us or doesn't, right? And so then a whole audience of people who felt the same way gravitated towards them. So I guess, build, I think building a great brand is about picking a lane and being really passionate about it and not caring what everybody else thinks. I think those are the brands that do really well. And then it really helps to have a great idea. Like with Red Bull, they didn't have the resources to go do all the marketing, so they just went and sampled their product at local bars in America. And before you know it, kids were like, I want a Red Bull in this, I want a Red Bull in that. And then the suppliers are like, what the heck is Red Bull? You know, and then they start calling distributors going, what's Red Bull? And yeah. the distributors reach them going, we need to order Red Bull, right? Mm -hmm. So they went guerrilla marketing, got their brand in, and then kind of did a pull effect. Now, lots of other brands have tried that since, but I think you have to figure out knowing your target audience 
the person and situation for which your brand is just perfect, right? Um, getting in their head and saying, what can I do to rock their world? Beyond just my product, what can I do to rock their world? Apple did it with an experience. Red Bull did it with an experience. I think any brand you, you really love, they're delivering an experience beyond the product itself. How do you find that for your brand? Mm -hmm. And it'll take some time, it'll take lots of conversations with your end user target audience, but if you invest in that and in core values that you preach, you'll build a following. And then it turns cultish. And then they go recruit more people, and then they influence others, and it just you know, it goes from there. I mean, if you, I, I joke around about those, uh, those silly water bottles. What are they called? Uh, Stanley. Stanley cups, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're, okay, so they have a cult following now, but they're also 35 years old, right? Yeah. So are there's also, really? you know, Nike is who it is today, but, but it took a while. But they stayed the course of this one thing, and they beat the drum. And like those are thoughts on that, yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, it's a great question. Branding is so important. There's a show that I'll recommend if anyone hasn't seen it or if any of you haven't seen it or anyone watching hasn't seen it. It's on Hulu. It's called Million Dollar Idea. And if you watch that, um, there's it's one season. It's like 15 episodes, but they talk about the selfie stick and the history of the selfie stick. They also talk about the hoses that, like, shrink up, and then when water comes through, they expand. It's, they've both been knocked off hundreds of times over, but brand is so, so important, and um, to Joe's point, it's, you know, he was talking about the pull effect, right? So distributors, a lot of times people say, well, I want to get broad distribution. I want to be on retail shelves. Well, you don't go to retailers, and you generally don't go to distributors to make that happen. What happens is, is that the distributors, their customers will come to them and say, hey, there's, there's a demand for this product, so I need to carry it. And so that's the pull, not the push. Um, it's about a movement. And so I know you're, I'm going to give you a relevant example because of the space that you're in. One of my really good friends, <coughs> um, his name's Riley Robertson. Riley, I'm going to send you his video so you'll see it. Um, he's an ultra marathon runner. He runs 50 and 100 Ks. Um, I think he's crazy for doing it, but he does it. And um, one of the things that, that he, he runs for, you know, his father passed away not long ago. Uh, he was in, his dad was in an automotive accident when he was like 17 years old, lost complete movement of his legs. So um, he, before that, he was an um, all country, like top of the line runner, got a full scholarship to college. And then before his senior year, he got in an accident, lost complete movement, amputated both legs. So Riley runs in his, his personal mission statement is I run for those who can't and it's his dad. So it's like this mission that's a movement. Like, yes, you're selling products, right? But you're selling so much more than that. It's just like when Apple comes out with a new product, let's be realistic. The, the last four iPhones are probably a 3% variance in difference. There's not much change at all, but guess what? As soon as they announce there's going to be a new iPhone, 80% of this room is ordering it before they even know what the difference is. Right. I'm, and I, I'm, uh, Samsung guy, Galaxy guy, for the record. Um, but um, but it's an app, it's a cult. Like you said, it's a cult. I mean, when Apple comes out with a new product, doesn't matter, no matter what it is, um, people are just ready to buy it because they bought into the brand. They under, they, they support the brand. Um, Nike, same thing, right? And then you, you, you just inspire people, just do it. Like how many people don't just do it? So you're inspiring people to just step out into faith, step out into, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a movement more than it is a product. That's, that's, that's brand to me is what is it? What is the movement behind what you're doing? Not just what are you selling? Right. What do you think talking about branding? Is there an importance or a need for branding within churches? Like I've seen a trend of there's these gurus on Instagram, TikTok talking about how a uh, church needs to up their Instagram game, up their branding game, make really cool graphics. And obviously some churches have like the big LED wall behind them. And do you think there's an element of branding practice that can be applied to the church or Christian settings? Who? Man, so there's two answers to that. <laughs> yeah, purely from a I'm customer. Purely, no, but think about it. From a, purely from a customer acquisition perspective, Purely from a butts and seats perspective, yeah, because um, we're entertained everywhere else we go, and nobody wants to walk into a church where everyone's half asleep, right? So the LED wall, the music, the lights, the experience um, could be what keeps a non-believer coming back for the second, third, or fourth time before they hear that special word from the Lord and give their life to, the God, to God, right? Versus if that, that same non-believer walked into a church that's like half asleep, they may turn around and walk out halfway through, right? Yeah. So there is an element of culturally delivering 
But then on the other side, there's a bunch of churches that are just basically like circus acts, right? It's just about that. And the pastor comes out, and they haven't even opened their Bible, and they've talked for 45 minutes. So that's the other extreme. But I do believe that churches that brand themselves well, and that doesn't mean the razzle-dazzle, but they just know who they are. They know what they believe. They're able to communicate that clearly. They know who their target audience is. You know, they want, they're focused on young families, or they're focused on whatever, and they can message to that well, which then gives them clarity on how to market in the community, what events to be part of, what events not to be part of. There's lessons to be learned from entrepreneurs that churches can do, uh, because otherwise a church can feel like it has to be all things to all people. And so now you've got the lady who's like, your music is too loud, we should be doing hymns, and you've got the people who are like, no, we need contemporary music. Well, how do you serve them all, right? So you kind of have to pick your lane. And that's part of branding. You pick your lane, you know your audience, and you just serve the audience. And you don't get distracted by all the other opportunities you could have done. And, and with, with churches, it's, you know, I'm sure this is going to be a statement that a lot of people are going to uh, scratch their heads at, but you know, there's a major element of business in churches, and, and, and people don't want to acknowledge that, um, but it's a reality. It's stewardship. When we were talking about season two, you know, we were talking about the, the uh, of our podcast, uh, we were talking about, you know, it's, it's stewardship can be used in any element of business or any aspect of business. And so how is the church stewarding their resources? You know, and, and so I think that, you know, Sunday morning service a lot of times is going to be milk right? Because you have a lot of people that are coming in that don't know, and you start challenging people who aren't comfortable in their faith. They don't know anything about faith. It's more so to get people in, but once they get in, it's, it's, it is a church have the ability to break a larger church into smaller groups and be able to, to cater to their audience. So young adults, families, youth ministry, and being able to break that out, which again, is just like business. It's catering to your audience. There's a lot of, you know, it, it, church is not a business, but there are a lot of functions within the four walls of the physical church that operate and, and need to operate uh, from a business perspective uh, the same way. I mean, uh, for example, someone that I know who um, you know as well uh, had a big hand in, in starting over 700 churches throughout the country. He was part of a, a nonprofit and they were planting churches. And he would tell me that there are clear metrics for like how much giving versus how much of staff and salary. And, and, and it's almost like doctors. I don't know how many of you know this, but doctors make a, a lot of money. And most of them are in tremendous amount of debt. And they don't know how to manage their money. They're terrible at managing their money, generally speaking. I hate to put people in a box, but widely understood that doctors aren't the greatest at managing their finances. And so it's the same. It, it's being able to cross-function and be able to give people the tools they need to be successful. And a lot of it comes down to stewardship. So it's the same same principle of stewardship. Okay. Quick follow-up question for you, Joe. So you, to rewind, you said that I need to ask my customer base. like Maybe, what, yeah, or your target audience. Or my target yeah. audience. What's a question I can ask them? to like try and find that ethos? You want to get to um, find, figure out their needs, wants, desires, and frustrations, not just related to the problem you solve, mm -hmm. but you want to get to know their needs, wants, desires, and frustrations in life in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll spend some time with you if you're up for it. I'll take you through a couple brand exercises where you kind of look at your audience through the lens of your product or solution. Mm -hmm. What are their needs, wants, desires, frustration? That's fairly easy. But then you pan the camera lens back and say, okay, forget that I'm even in this business. What can I get to know about them as a whole? And usually as you start identifying the fringe problems and frustrations for them, you find the real answer to great branding. Because sometimes solving their product itch isn't what it is. I mean, look at Amazon, right? Look. Amazon Prime is a perfect example of a brand that knows its audience so well that they're like, yes, we need to sell them products. We want to sell them shampoos and conditioners and this and that. But we're going to introduce this Prime service because these people also love entertainment. They also love convenience. They also love all these other things. And they build that into Prime. And now we're all Prime addicts that happen to shop at Amazon. You know what I mean? That's the panning the lens back. So there's a couple of exercises we can do. Any of you, when you're ready to start your business, I'll teach For it sure. to you and you can yeah. teach it to them. Um, it helps get into the psyche of your end user. And usually your competition's too lazy to do the work. They're too lazy to do that exercise. 
So they just keep hammering the customer with, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Here's my unique value proposition. Here's what makes us unique. And the customer's like, you sound like everybody else. And then you come kind of on a side wing with something they're like, oh, you're, you're awesome. I'll buy your product, but I'm buying it because I'm in love with your brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You understand so. the issue. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, well, that's awesome. Thank you guys, appreciate awesome, it. Thank, Thank you for coming on. Great I think we have another Eve coming up. Awesome, sounds good. Guys, if you're still here, thank you very much. Give yourself yeah, a round of applause. Thank you for hanging Thank you for being here. This is awesome. This is Eve. Hello, Eve. Eve, tell Joe about your business. I've followed your business oh, since yeah. you launched. I've seen a lot of your interviews, and you've done you a tremendous everybody. job. Thank you. I've been here twice as long as you have. Okay. Yeah, wow. I was <laughs> helping with the pitch when he first yeah. Okay. came. Yeah. Um, so I own a business called Eve's Original Sin Cookies. Um, it's pretty much the customer gets to be the baker just without all the mess. So they get to come up with the different flavorings that they want, and I make them from home, and then they get to try their creations. Um, eventually... Uh, when I have a storefront, it'll be like a cold stone experience. Yep. So they'll get to pick the cookie dough, the mix-ins, and then um, they'll be baked on the spot within two to three minutes. But right now you ship them the right. ingredients, they get to do it at home? I'm going to try shipping this summer, but right now it's just they come pick them up. Okay. Yeah. Cool. She's, she she's sold everyone in the town of Cedarville, every <laughs> single person. Cool. Okay, got it. <laughs> <Yes>. <coughs> um, but my question is, uh, so I'm a 19-year-old girl. I'm starting to get to the point in my life where I'm thinking about a family and mm -hmm. the future and... How am I going to juggle a business and a family someday? Because I know even now, when I'm trying to be social or do something, I'm getting texts, emails about my business yeah. and how to deal with that. So I know you guys have families and you have very successful businesses. So can you talk a little bit about how you juggle those things? I picked Joe's brain on this, so I, I'll, I'm happy to share in your struggle. But I'm, I'd like to hear Joe's experience. Wow. So, yeah, it's a good point. You've, like about the time your business could be really taking off, right, in a couple, three years, because it usually takes some time, mm -hmm. you could be, like, getting married and thinking about having your first baby or whatever, right? Um, a, I would say commit that to the Lord, because if, if this business is of him, just like you, right, he has a purpose for your life. He's, he knows what you're going to be when you're 80 years old. So he also knows what your business is going to be. Eight months from now, 18 months from now, 80 months from now. So you almost have to start praying now, Lord, this business is yours. I'm running it for now because, like, I'm a one-woman shop. But I need you to start bringing the people that are going to take care of this when I'm doing more important things, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just like some of you are praying for your ideal spouse. You can pray for your future business partner, for that first key employee who's really going to come and shoulder the load and be like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest business idea ever, and I know I could go make 80 grand a year somewhere else, but I'll work for you for half that or 30, because I want to be part of this with you, right? Mm -hmm. So you can be praying for those people, because there's some people who are just looking for a great business to come work in. They may not have the entrepreneurial gumption you do, mm -hmm. they just want a great job, and they want to be in, with a cool product and good customers. And so, yeah, start praying for that. I think that would be number one. Okay. Um, and then number two would be, Look at your business model, you know, as you transition from, hey, I'm just hand delivering to, hey, I'm going to start shipping to eventually we're going to have stores. Mm -hmm. Get lots of counsel on how you build the business model, like we were saying earlier, so that there's plenty of margin so that you can hire. Your idea is so cool, you shouldn't just price it cheap. Mm -hmm. Price it premium so there's plenty of margin so you can hire good people who can run the show for you. Look, I'll tell you. I'm year three, four of my business. We hit our fourth birthday. His company hit their three and a half year birthday. Mm -hmm. We have people who work for us who do 90% of the work. Like, mm -hmm. I can literally, I'm a huge Liverpool fan. Like, I could literally stop in the middle of the day and go watch two and a half hours of soccer. And it doesn't affect our business at all because there's people who love what they do doing the work. So that's what you have to look forward to. Yes, for the next three years, would you have to go all in? But if you work for the next three years to say, in three years, I want to have like three rock stars working for me, mm -hmm. one who handles all the finance and operations, one who handles all the sales, mm -hmm. and one who handles all the customer service, okay. right? If you had three of those, that's really all the three things you do, you're good. And you can be Miss Queen brand lady, and you could do podcasts and, mm -hmm. you know, design new products and be with your kids. And mm -hmm. like my wife got to raise both, homeschool both her kids in an entrepreneurial home. She was involved in the business with me, but
but because we had a business, mm -hmm. we got to be with our kids all the way they were growing up. So that's the good side of it. Okay. So, yeah. And I, I have some ideas at some point. I'm here until Friday morning. Mm -hmm. But I, I have some ideas for your business that I'd like to share with you that I, I think that. would be in scaling. Um, yeah recurring revenue, MRR, ARR type stuff, mm -hmm. uh, subscription. But I will tell you, that's what I was talking about earlier, the challenge is that, and, and this is hard for me too, when I hire, I, I kind of, I want people to think in an entrepreneurial way, but at the same token, not everybody is wired that way. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay, and it's actually a benefit. But one of the mistakes I've made is I've tried to, you know, I'm thinking, what, what would matter to me? Right, and what matters to me is equity, equity in the company and, and ownership, and, and that's not what matters to everyone. So it's kind of, I think, getting to know the right people, asking them, you know, what, what makes you tick, you know, what, and then being able to say, okay, this is the right person, I can entrust them with this, you know, setting up performance-based compensation to where they actually have a vested interest in success of the company, so they're not just punching a time clock, it's, you know, whatever they do, they're gonna get rewarded, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a saying that some people are terrified of not knowing what they're gonna make every day. I'm terrified of knowing what I'm gonna make every day, right? Yeah. Like go, going to work every day and knowing no matter how hard I work or how successful I am, I'm gonna make the same amount of money. That is terrifying. I lose sleep over that. And so it's it's like finding the right people and then there's gonna be a right time and God will, God will put that time in. But Joe's right, at this time, I mean, just you're sprinting and you've done a tremendous job. I've, I've followed you on social media, your brand and what you've done. So the biggest challenge for you is gonna be the scaling aspect because mm -hmm. you're doing a lot of it on your own. Yeah, and there's tiring. only one of you. Yeah, there's one of you. Yeah. So. But, but you're gonna shift your business model soon and start yeah. shipping stuff. And That's mm -hmm. some of my ideas. That yeah, I pray, for, okay. pray, we'll for three, pray for three, start praying for three servant hearted people okay. who fall in love with your brand. And then you're good. Okay. Problem solved. Awesome. Okay. Thank Wonderful. you, guys. All right. I think we have another person to ask question. Eve, thank you for coming on. Thank you, it's guys. Amazing. Thank you're you. welcome. Here we go. How are we on time? What are we doing, Cooper? 8.07. 8.07. What's right. time? <laughs> we got time. Good. All right. Addy, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Hello, Addy. Hi, Hi, Addy. My name's Addy. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Lost my voice there. Okay. So I have a quick question. <coughs> Um, so obviously when you're starting up, there's a lot of work that goes into it. There's a ton of stuff and you only have so much time. So what did you guys personally prioritize when you started up your business? Um, when I started my business, I prioritized wrong, Okay. right? I was all into what today back, we would, websites were barely coming out in the mid nineties, but like it would have been the equivalent of the website, the brochure, the pretty stuff, the, the, and, and a mentor said to me, Get out and sell. Go get the revenue. Okay. So if I was advising somebody today, be like, yeah, go whatever generates the revenue um, and validates the business is the best use of your time, the entrepreneur. Then all the other things can are secondary to that. Okay. Because otherwise, we can all spend a lot of time tinkering, making, building, rewriting the website, mm -hmm. you know, rewriting the brochure, and think we've accomplished much, but nobody knows about us. So it's anything outbound, anything social, anything marketing, anything sales, would I think would be the best use of an entrepreneur's time. Yeah, he, you just described paralysis by analysis. Paralysis by analysis, I always get them mixed up, but it, you can overthink things and perfection is the enemy of success as an entrepreneur. So if you're seeking to be perfect or there's always gonna be things that you can do and you can justify, well, I'm not gonna go start selling until this happens or until this happens and you'll always find other things that need to happen. So getting to revenue and then just really just communicate, even before revenue, figuring out what's gonna get you to revenue. So like asking people and telling them, I don't want you to you know, sugarcoat, I want you to tell me, you know, is this, is this valuable to you at this price point? Mm -hmm. It would be more valuable at this price point. You know, it, it's the, the understanding of market research and just really understanding and being passionate about what you're doing, understanding the competitive landscape, you know, and knowing who you're up against, what you're up against. All the other things can fall in line. You know, you can MVP for a website. You know, you don't have to have a $100,000 website out of the gate. You shouldn't have a $100,000 website out of the gate. But you should, you know, something, a Shopify site costs you 60 bucks a month. Watch some YouTube videos, figure out how to put a Shopify site on, uh, online and, you know, and, and operate from there until you can graduate, transfer it to WordPress or Webflow or whatever, and, and then continue to grow. Like, you, you don't, you know, it's cliche and we've all heard it. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. And so just starting, just taking action. So many people just 
will think about all the different ways things can go wrong or how they should or shouldn't do it. And then they, they don't just step out into faith. Take that step, you know, and, and get a different perspective on failure. <laughs> you know, like I asked my son, my son's three years old, and, and he's not old enough to always answer me. Sometimes he answers me dinosaurs, which is not a relevant answer, but I'll ask him, what did you fail at today? You know, and, and, and if he doesn't have an answer for me, I tell him, well, I want you to have an answer for me tomorrow because I'm trying to change his mindset on failure. Failure is not a bad thing. It's a way to learn lessons. Um, and so I, you know, it's just get out there and just try and don't be afraid of rejection and don't, you know, and embrace negative or you know, constructive criticism to help you grow, but just take action and get out there. Get to revenue, like Joe said, as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Addy, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Addie. I think we're going to have Annie pop on. Um, but while she's getting ready, I want to ask you guys how you came to knowledge or came to know Cedarville. So, Scott, obviously, you've been mm -hmm. here longer than Joe. I'd be interested to know. Yeah, I would love to answer that. Is it okay if I, we take just a quick break for like a go minute? I just have to use the restroom. Well, you run, I'll, I'll take yeah, my go ahead. with this. That and works. then I'll start with Annie's question and then we'll go from there. Yeah. <coughs> I think I mentioned Earl Seals, so I heard about Cedarville through that, through him, and then was reminded of um, Cedarville when, through the pitch. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I was supposed to be here two years ago for the pitch. Yeah. I was the guy whose flight got canceled, blah, blah, uh. blah, which made Scott step in. And so yeah, I've always wanted to, to come back. Okay, wait, so that was the reason that Scott got here the first time? Was yeah. Because of your flight? Yeah. He stepped in, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. That was interesting. Me. That's cool. Well, so this is Annie. For those who don't know, this is the uh, president of Q, uh, Cedarville University Entrepreneurship Org. Um, they've been uh, gracious to let us be here today. They're hosting this along with myself. And then we have Kingdom Commerce, uh, the podcast with uh, Scott, uh, Joe, Luke, and Cooper. Um, they were shooting that earlier today. Yeah. Walked in while they were preparing. <laughs> um, I want to be in that newsroom so bad. But this is fun, too, because I get to be with you guys here. So it's exciting. So, Annie, uh, do you have a question for Joe here while we wait for Scott? Yes. So my question is just a broad question. You guys were talking about um, you want to save us from the mistakes that you guys have made. And so I would just love to hear some of, like, the biggest mistakes that you guys have made that we could learn from now. Now, yeah. And, you know, even as you were saying that, it was like, do I really want to save you guys from the mistakes? Because like he was saying, the mistakes are where you guys are going to learn. So you kind of have to go do them yourself. Yeah. But maybe we can at least warn you of like how to get out of them, you know? Yeah. Um, so that we can make other mistakes. Yeah. yeah maybe like it's uh, different mistakes that we can make. I'm telling you, like um, God's going to use entrepreneurship to sanctify you, right? And, and sanctification is not pretty. It's hard work. Many of you started that journey already. So you're going to learn things about yourself and your heart that only entrepreneurship is going to expose. So to your question, um, in, in my heart was hiding pride. In my heart was hiding greed. In my heart was hiding kind of like I'm better than you. And all these things that entrepreneurship brought out. Because all it took was a little success and people going, wow, Joe, that's so amazing. You accomplished that. Or, oh, Joe, that was such a great talk you did. Or, and suddenly, like, Satan's like, see, Joe? Like, that, you're pretty badass. Like, good. Hey, you know, buy into this, buy into this. And, um, and that, those are the traps he's laying for you. And I've always, a well, mentor taught me this. He said, Joe, since the day you've been born, Satan's been studying you, right? He, he can't get in your head, but he can observe. He can watch as you're being raised, your idiosyncrasies, your strengths, your weaknesses. And so the traps that are laid out for you are very specific for you. And so for me, some of the big mistakes I made were, I'll put them in three categories, people mistakes, um, kind of business mistakes. But let me tell you, I'll just focus on the people stuff and he can focus on something else. She wants to know the mistakes we've made to kind of accelerate their learning have? experience. <laughs> and well, the question was biggest mistake. Biggest but mistake. Biggest. Save yeah. us some more time. Yeah. Um, my, my biggest people mistakes ended up in the area of trusting the wrong people. Um, in my early entrepreneurship days, anybody who, want, who liked my idea, 
I was like, oh, I'll just tell you everything and I'll just open the doors to everything and I'll just make everything accessible and there's people out there who'll take advantage of it, right? Um, so trusting the wrong people without discerning, without prayerfully saying, Lord, like, is this the right person or getting counsel or anything? Sometimes it was a business partnership. Um, another, the other big people issue I've had is um, using people to get what I want versus the real calling as an entrepreneur is God wants to use you to bless or benefit other people, right? So uh, the reason I think that's a big mistake is now when I look back 20 years, man, like there were some people God put in my life where I totally blew it, right? I could have led them to the Lord. I could have been a better example. I could have said the right thing in that moment when I knew they were down, but I was so upset at them that they didn't close the sale that like, you know, it was about me and the sale and not about them. So um, the biggest mistake I make, I think I made looking back was not having God's eyes for the people he put in my path. Competitors, vendors, employees, clients, um, because it was all about me. And that's kind of a regret you carry for a while, right? You can, you can ask God to forgive you and all that, and he does forgive us, but you're kind of like, oh, man, like, I hope I don't run into that person because I owe them a massive apology, you know? Yeah. No, I, what you said really, really hit hard, and it's still something I struggle with, and that is, um, you know, realizing the people aspect and building the, the people up around you and adding value into them because, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's a certain part of you that needs to be tunnel visioned. Like you have to, you have to know what the goal is because there's so many things on a daily basis that will try to distract you or pull you away from that, that you have to keep in mind what the goal is, but you have to also keep in mind that these are also God's children that your work that, that are entrusting their future, their family's future with you. And so, um, building them up, um, another big mistake I made and I still struggle with, frankly, is um, delegating because, it, you know, and, and I, I have delegated, you know, and Joe was talking earlier about the deliverable. I can take a day, a couple days off and, and, and there's no, no issue there, but there are certain things that I just feel, and I justify it in my own mind, like, you know, this is God's business. And if I, you know, I know that I'm the most qualified person to do this, but if I don't allow someone else to, you know, bump their toe or skid their knee and, and make the mistake and learn from it and grow from it, then at the end of the day, I'm going to be the only one standing. So it's building people up around you, being a servant leader. Um, and that's something that is still, I still work through. Yeah, I know uh, just through working with podcasts and stuff, um, in my experience, I've worked for six years with my dad which has been a great experience with his marketing agency. And he came here to Q, mm -hmm. which was awesome. We had him up on the screen there. And uh, seeing him work with the people within our company, um, seeing him really care for them and be like, there's no like amount of vacation time we give. Mm -hmm. It's like, take the time. We know you work hard for us. You're bought into our brand. You will work for us, but you're working with us, really. Yeah, right. that's the big thing. So it's it's been cool to see that and then apply it to what I do um, in my own life and working with others, and also with the opportunities within the school itself. Being a discipleship leader, um, something I want to pursue next year. Um, taking that same mindset of like not necessarily that someone is an employee, but someone you can work alongside with. Um, towards the goal that your brand has. It's like branding, connecting yep. it all, servant leadership, branding, what you're trying to do to serve your audience. Um, it's something that it's cool to understand going through the journey of just what you learn and what you see. And, and it's it, synergistic it, too, right? So it's the same way that you need to understand your, your customer's pain points or how to serve them best. Having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, those heart-to-hearts with your employees or the people that are on mission with you. I hate the word employees. I know they're yeah. employees, but you know that, I, that word, I, I, make, I cringe at it because it's, yeah. it's like I, it 
puts them beneath me and, and, and servant leadership and, <clears throat> and that by definition is I'm beneath them. I'm serving yeah. and, and pushing, you know, leading from, from behind. But it's getting to know them and what their personal goals are. Like, you know, what, what are your goals in life? How do I help support those? Because yeah. the more that you take an interest in your people as an entrepreneur, even, you know, the, 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 the few limited people you start with all the way to when you have 100, 200 people working for you, the more interest you show in your people, the more they're going to want to work to honor that relationship that you have with them. They, they don't feel like a number, right? So it's it's all a people thing, you know? That's, Do you have anything else, Annie? No, nope, that's all. Awesome, but thank you. Well, thank you guys. Do you guys have anything regarding Kingdom Commerce you shooting a new episode or a new season um, yeah. this week? Uh, anything new going on there? I think, um, well, so yeah, so season two will start dropping in about two weeks. Season awesome. one is still kind of running now. Um, the guys can get you all the information about um, how to follow and yeah. and keep. But a lot of the things we talked about today are the topics we're taking on in the podcast. Awesome. Just deep dive stuff on it. Yeah, you know, like when when should I go for funding and is it okay to take debt if I'm going to do funding or should I go get an investor? If I'm getting an investor, should I get a Christian investor or a non-Christian investor? What's okay? And uh, Topics, you know, ranging from... How do I do market research all the way to how do I find the right business partner, you know, and discern through all the challenges of partnership. Those are all the topics we're taking on. So, Excellent. yeah, I would love for you have you guys listen, join that community, ask your questions there, and uh, see where things go. Yeah, awesome. It was started to, you know, ultimately, and, and we've expanded scope a little bit more, but it was started for students. It was started because Cooper told me that during his summer he was looking for podcasts on entrepreneurship to listen to and outside of one that everyone's heard of that just gives examples of one person and what they did in their journey. I mean, we could watch documentaries all day, but it's like, how do we how do we engage and how do we talk about what we've learned from? And so that was the problem is we have someone that's hungry for knowledge, hungry for experience, and you know, being able to be that vessel of our lessons and the blood baths and the, the 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 successes and being able to share what led us down those paths and um, so that's it, it's just that's discipleship right and and it's been a lot of fun to be able to do it with Joe I, I learned from Joe as well and you yeah, know he here. he um, he has a lot of experience to the point where you know I I'm still in that the trenches working with early stage entrepreneurs J Joe enjoys being on I'm the smart pod enough to podcast. get away from them <laughs> Joe, Joe likes talking <laughs> to it broadly but I work with them day in and day out yeah. um, and that's where my hair went so um, but it's it's still it's a lot of fun um, doing it with these guys I mean Luke and Cooper both have been tremendous to work with in that and um, you know I yeah some of you should come on the show and ask questions or yeah. tell us your stories and about the startups you're working on because I think that's what's going to inspire others to go, wow, you're in college and you're thinking about starting this business or you've already started that business. It would be fun to interview you guys. Tomorrow we're interviewing the Crown folks uh. just to hear their story and get it out there. You know, Cedarville knows it, but the rest of the world doesn't, so how do we get that out? Yeah. So we'd love to feature some of your stories too. And, and it's inspirational. It's inspirational to see that you have college students that are um, – <laughs> that are that – are, doing it while they're full-time in school. You know, I talk to people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and have worked for someone else their whole life. They hate what they do for work. They do it because they feel like they have to. And, you know, and, and to see college students stepping out and just doing with limited resources and building these companies, the success that Crown has had and Eve has had and Aaron's had, I mean, Aaron was on the news and, you know, all the things that, that, that these students have done while still pursuing their degree and being a full-time student in the cornfields, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really, really impressive. And you don't know the people that you're going to, um, to inspire in doing so. People that are twice, three times your age, you'll inspire because of what you're doing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming on. Thank you to uh, Cooper who came up with this idea. He uh, called me. Uh, I don't know, Monday, mm. Sunday, something like Before that. Before he, he asked like, me, huh? What if we did this? And I was like, I don't know. I've never done that, but we're going to try it. We've done it. This has been fun. No, it's a great so setup. It's been a great awesome. time. So thank yeah. you, Annie. Thank you, Q. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you all. Um, yeah, Joe, can, we, can we give yeah. Annie a round of applause for yeah, yeah. Yes. Round of applause for him.
Awesome. Just such a great job. She she stepped into the role when I first started getting involved with Cedarville, and, and I stepped away for the answer really quick. Mm-hmm. I, the way I got introduced was how the same way I met Joe, was through Earl and CBF, okay. Christian Business Fellowship, and um, there was an event and a Beyond Angels event here, and I came up, and funny story, I was driving and said I was two minutes away, and I said my GPS must be wrong because all I see is cornfields, and then all of a sudden there was this university, and um, here I am, yep. and I keep coming back, so. That's awesome. awesome. Well, All right. Joe, thank you so Scott, much. thank you for coming. Thank you, thank thank you guys. guys for tuning in. Like and subscribe. Check out all their stuff down below. Thank you guys for coming again. That's all. Bye-bye. Awesome.